What is going on across the National Football League with all these calls involving roughing the passer with Chris Jones, with Grady Jarrett? We're going to be talking about that as well as the Carolina Panthers firing their head coach following a 1-4 and four start. And are the Arizona Cardinals in trouble? I mean, they've been down in every game this season by halftime. That's five games. We're going to be discussing and dissecting the Cardinals and their play calling on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys are able to join us. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of the channel that we like to call Time to Football. If you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button because we come out with these weekly podcasts every week. And we're also going to be previewing week six of the 2022 season as well towards the end of this episode. Uh, now... If you haven't noticed, Anthony, if you are a regular viewer with us, our co-host, is not joining us here today, and that's because, no, he did not get fired for a second straight week. He did not uh, show up on the show. Well, okay, the real reason is, yes, he did get fired, but I'm going to make up an excuse and say that I am sick right now, and uh, he cannot show up on the show because I don't want him around that because, uh, who knows, maybe I have COVID. Hey, everything is COVID nowadays. Oh, your elbow is broken? COVID. Hey, Rashad Penny, you broke your tibula? Nah, that's not a broken tibula. That's COVID. What's that weird rash? It's COVID. Two years later, and people are still saying we're in a pandemic. <sighs> Anyways, no, it's just like a little bit of the sniffles. I'm feeling kind of fatigued and stuff like that. So I don't want to expose Anthony towards all that. So hopefully next week, Anthony can come join us. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get into the topics of today's episode. So after this video premieres on YouTube, you're going to notice timestamps on this video for the particular segments. Feel free to skip around to go to a different segment, as well as these segments are going to be posted throughout the duration of the week on this YouTube channel, going to be split up. So if you wanted to wait for that, didn't want to watch this very long video, by all means, you're more than welcome to, to click out of this and wait for the segments to be posted. But the first topic to talk about are the bad calls that were called on Grady Jarrett and Chris Jones. One of the games didn't really affect the outcome, while the other, it might have affected the outcome of that game. Grady Jarrett gets around. Beautiful play design, by the way, by the Falcons' defensive coordinator to set up a pick to the guard and the tackle so that Jarrett can get around them and kind of use his momentum to sack Brady, bring him to the ground. Call that as roughing the passer. For Chris Jones, it was kind of a body weight kind of thing, kind of putting his body weight on Derek Carr, and they call that roughing the passer. Let's first talk about Grady Jarrett and Tom Brady. Jerome Boger was in charge of that play call. If you guys don't remember, last week in week four, Jerome Boger was the referee for that Bills-Ravens game. Two minutes, three seconds left in that game, a roughing the passer penalty was called on the Baltimore Ravens that allowed the Bills to get a first down and eventually come back and win that game. If you go back to that call, go back and watch that play, there wasn't really much of a roughing the passer to be called there. I mean, he really didn't lead with his helmet, and he didn't attack the helmet of the quarterback either. It just kind of brought him down. I guess you could say maybe it was like a split second late, but still, like it wasn't anything to constitute throwing a flag and potentially costing the Ravens the game. Well, it did cost the Ravens that game against the Buffalo Bills. And then fast forward a week later, Jerome Boger does the same thing, costing the Falcons the game. Against the Buccaneers, we don't know for sure if the Falcons are going to come back. I get it. I get it. But that pretty much put the dagger in it, saying that the Bucs are going to guarantee win this game. So Boger is under a lot of pressure from the National Football League. As I mean, as far as the media goes, I don't know if the NFL is going to go into their independent investigation or anything like that. But this kind of dates back to years ago. Uh, and I guess most notably, 2021. The Bengals versus Raiders playoff game. Uh, Boger was intentionally left out of the playoffs because of the efficient crew and how not so good of a job they were doing. So there's a history and a long track record of Boger and this poor officiating. And uh, this Jarrett call was apparently the camel that broke the straw's back or the straw that broke the camel's back, whatever the hell the saying is. And now people are figuring out, okay, maybe Boger should be investigate. I don't know. Like investigating seems like a harsh word. Take it out of games. I don't know what the word is, but it, it is a bad call. Now, let's put a pause on Grady Jarrett. Let's talk about Chris Jones. Monday Night Football, putting his body weight supposedly on Derek Carr and it being a roughing the passer penalty. And you go back and you watch it. Didn't really constitute for a flag to be thrown on that play. And the Chiefs fan definitely let them hear it at Arrowhead. That was before halftime, like before the two-minute warning, and it led to a first down by the Raiders. 
and they were able to get a field goal out of it. And then when the kickoff, the second half kickoff happened, fans were still booing uh, the officiating crew. So they were trying to let the people know, like, or the officiating crew know, like, hey, we saw what happened with Grady Jarrett. We saw the roughing the passer penalty. Why are you doing the exact same thing? And you could potentially cost us the game. Now, it didn't cost them the game. The Raiders eventually, you know, I don't know why they went for it on two-point conversion when you could have tied the game. But anyways, like, whatever. And Devontae Adams pushes a guy. Anyways, whatever. We're talking about the officiating. It didn't lead to the Chiefs losing the game, per se, but still, it was a very bad call. So, why is all this happening? It's because of Tua Tagovailoa, man. Because of Tua and the hits that he took in back-to-back weeks and the concussions that he's been suffering, being hospitalized, they want to be very, very safe. They already put in place new protocols for concussions, like Teddy Bridgewater, to his replacement against the Jets. Someone up in the sky was like, hey, I see a little bit of a stagger. Maybe it wasn't that big of a deal, but I see a little bit of a stagger. Let's be safe. Let's take him out of the game. Uh, And then he didn't return for the remainder of the game. So they're being very, very careful with this. And I think of the first drive for the Chiefs and for the Raiders, like they called sacks like immediately. Like they didn't even let players bring down Patrick Mahomes or Derek Carr, they were like, hey, you're wrapped up. We know for sure that you can't escape out of this. We're going to call the play dead before they could even hit the ground. So they're not taking any chances with this. They don't want any more pressure. So I guess Tua could be the reason why, uh, I mean, not him particularly. Obviously, you can't control what happened to him. But his situation is the reason why all of this is going on. But things need to change. And the fact that like these kind of plays aren't reviewable I have no idea why. Like, maybe there's something in the rule book that says, like, oh, you can't review penalties of this nature because of this. I mean, I know that that pass interference after the Saints got screwed in that game against the Rams, like, pass interference eventually was like reviewable, but it really didn't work out because, like, they just nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, they just stuck, they stuck with the call that was on the field. But roughing the passer, like, do you guys feel like this should be reviewable at least? Like, It's a 15-yard penalty, it's a first down, and it's something like defenders have a very, very hard time. Like, I feel for defenders. Like, what are you supposed to do? I can't put my body weight on them. Okay, that makes sense. I can't attack, tackle them with my helmet. I can't lead with my... That makes perfect sense. Like, you want to care about safety. I get it. But what do you do? If you can't put your body weight on a player, you have to swing the player, use your momentum, and kind of bring them down. Oh, well, no, that's roughing the passer too. Like... Okay, you can't attack them low either because, you know, the ACL can, which makes sense. Like, it's just so hard for a defender. Like, what are you supposed to do? How can you sack a quarterback at this point? Like, uh, I guess the only thing that you could really do is just, like, kind of run up, go behind them, and not really, like, suplex. Like, because you got to be kind of gentle. Like, you don't want to, oh, no, no, don't tackle them. Like, just, just go down. Just go down. Like, Grady Jarrett did nothing wrong. Like, he used his momentum to sack Tom Brady. Tom Brady's a 6'4", 230-pound guy. Like, if he was just kind of gentle with him and, like, he just sat on his lap, number one, hey, yo, number two, like, he could just get out of there and just kind of roll out of the pocket or something and complete the pass. You know, like, what, do you, what are you supposed to do? Tom Brady post game was like, I don't, I don't throw the flags. I don't blame Tom Brady. I know a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Brady gets away with this and that and you got to protect Brady. And, uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know. But, like... If I was in Brady's shoes, I'd be like, free play? I don't agree with it, but pfft, sure. Like, I want to win the game. <laughs> like, you can't get mad at that. Leave a comment down below, man. I, I would love to interact with you guys and, and hear what you guys have to say about this and how it involves the future of the NFL. Do you think that roughing the passer should be reviewable? Moving on to the next topic, the Carolina Panthers fired Matt Rule following an 11-27 and record as the Carolina Panthers head coach across three seasons, starting 1-4 in 2022, and now the Panthers were like, we're done, we've had enough, we've seen enough, and Steve Wilkos, Steve Wilkes, not Wilkos, Wilkos is the guy that goes like, get off my stage, Steve. Wilkes will be leading the charge, who was the Arizona Cardinals head coach in 2018, He'll be leading the charge for the Panthers for the remainder of the 2022 season. So what does this mean for the Panthers moving forward? Now, first, I don't want to criticize a guy who's at the lowest point in his life. He's just lost his job. He's got a family, a wife, kids to feed. With that said, the man is making $40 million guaranteed for doing nothing. I think he's fine. 
So if he's okay making $40 million for doing nothing, let's go ahead and criticize that. Carolina Panthers fans, rejoice. Breathe in. Breathe out. Oh, you feel that? The air, it's so clean and Bank of America Stadium. Because now your offensive players can be utilized the way that they need to be. I know Carol, uh, Carolina has been using Christian McCaffrey as a pass catching back the right way in the last couple of weeks. But finally, maybe DJ Moore does something. But again, Baker Mayfield's a quarterback. He's going to be out for a couple of weeks. I don't know. That's a whole completely different topic. But anyways, there's no way or nowhere for the Panthers to go but up from here on out. Now, a lot of Panthers fans I've been reading on Reddit and threads and stuff like that are like, man, I wish Rule was still the head coach so we can be 1-16 in and get Bryce Young or whatever it may be. But yeah, I know. I, I completely understand that too. But for the Panthers moving forward, if you did care about this season, this can only be a good thing for you guys moving forward. I mean, it just comes down to the point, like kind of like the Jim Ursay philosophy that he had with Carson Wentz, where it's like, we know after following Carson Wentz for a whole season, watching him play in the last two games where the Colts kind of blew it against the Jaguars, especially in the last game, where we know that after you blew those two games and cost us a playoff spot, we know that you're not the quarterback that's going to lead us to the Super Bowl. We could keep you around because you had a good stat line. We get it. But are you going to be a Super Bowl quarterback or not? And Jim Merce was like, this guy will never lead us to a Super Bowl. Let's just go ahead and move on right now before it's way too late. Let's go ahead and get some sort of compensation, third round pick, whatever it is, before it's too late. The Panthers are kind of in the same boat. Where David Tepper has come out and kind of explained the firing of Matt Rule said, hey, he kind of lost his intensity for the Panthers. He He's not going to be the guy that's going to lead us to a Super Bowl. Like, just envision yourself. Can Matt Rule be that guy? For Tepper, it was no. So, like, don't waste any more time. Let's just go ahead and get rid of him. Uh, for the Panthers and their head coaching search moving forward, I think there's only one name right now this season that kind of sticks out, and that is D'Amico Ryans. What a season that he's been having. What a year that he had last year as well. I mean, helping the defense do well enough to get the 49ers to the NFC Championship game. But this year, especially, like, only allowing 12 points per game on defense, which is tied first with the Buffalo Bills, only allowing 249 yards a game to opposing offenses, which is first in the NFL. Ryans, after retiring in 2016, being a defensive quality control coach in 2017, eventually getting promoted, following another promotion to defensive coordinator in 2021, like, he has been doing a very stellar job. And I think the Panthers have to view him as candidate number one. Now you can't interview him until obviously later on and you want to see the season play out, see if he's actually the real deal. I get that. But D'Amico Ryan so far is a very good head coaching candidate. Like throughout the duration of this video as well, like leave your comments down below. I would love to hear who else, who else do you think is a good coaching candidate for the Carolina Panthers? Uh, but for Matt Rule, this kind of reminds me of Urban Meyer, like the whole situation where Shad Khan hired Urban Meyer when he had no head coaching experience. And I remember when that happened, I was like, what the heck is going on here? I know like the Facebook uh, 40, 50 year olds that only care about college football are like, there's a very good hire because Urban Meyer's a good man. He's yeah. But like us NFL fans that only watch NFL and not really college are like, Hey, this is not that good of a hire. Like he only wants that job because of Trevor Lawrence. Like he's going to be the, he's going to have the first overall pick. He wants to build Trevor Lawrence, a, a good, solid team. Like, he thinks he's the franchise QB. Like, he wants to build around him. Like, imagine taking a job just for one player. Man. He, and he treated his players like they were college kids and not adults. Now, Matt Rule, like, no head coaching experience in the NFL, only came from college. And it's like, why are you guaranteeing Matt Rule so much money and a seven-year contract when he has no head coaching experience. Now, I know that Matt Rule was kind of a better guy than Urban Meyer. I don't think Rule was kicking Eddie Pinheiro in practice. It was like, make your effing kicks. Or was sticking around at bars and uh, infidelity with his wife. Anyways, that's uh, a completely different topic. Like, I'm not going to... The man's at the lowest point in his life. He's got a wife. He's got a family. We can't, we can't criticize him. But anyways, Matt Rule, much better guy than uh, Urban Meyer. But anyways... I don't understand what the Panthers were thinking, guaranteeing so much money. So that's going to cost them a little bit. And maybe that's going to, I don't know if this for sure, leave a comment down below, but does head coaching 
salary affect cap space at all for players? I genuinely do not know. So if you guys know in the comments, I would love to hear your thoughts. But if it does, you're going to be in a hole for the next three years. But, I mean, you could have a, a be in the position where you have the top five pick. You could draft Will Anderson from Alabama or Bryce Young, whoever it is, and you could turn your franchise around. Uh, Baker Mayfield is going to be out for a couple of weeks uh, because of a high ankle sprain. P.J. Walker will be filling in. Uh, and, I mean, that could be good news because D.J. Moore had 11 receptions off of 18 targets for 151 yards last season in two games with P.J. Walker. Now, 75 yards a game, that's not like elite by any chance, but, I mean, that's much better than 50 to 60 yards that he's getting right now. So, But this can only go up for the Panthers, um, but we'll see. I mean, tough game this week against the Rams. We'll see how the Panthers respond with Steve Wilkes. Would you believe me if I said that the Arizona Cardinals have been down at halftime in every game this season? Five weeks. Always down. Always coming back. Always in a deficit. Sometimes it works out like that OT victory against the Vegas Raiders. Sometimes it does not like last week against the Philadelphia Eagles. What is going on with the Cardinals specifically in the first half that is leading to all of these deficit. To further explain that, we're going to be breaking down some film. Disclaimer, I'm not an NFL head coach, but I watch 16 hours of football every week for the last three or four years. So I don't have the knowledge to the extent of a coach, but I have a general understanding of telling you what went wrong with a play, what went right with a play. So let's dissect the film. First off, we want to show you this design screen to Zach Ertz. This is the second play of the game. Kyler Murray designed screen, Zach Gertz. Okay, you look at this, you're like, okay, what's wrong with it? You get a decent amount of yards. Well, nothing's really wrong with it, but it feeds into the idea that in the first half, they're not really taking intermediate shots down the field. More so, dump offs to your receivers and your tight ends. Let them get a lot of yards after the catch. Let them do their thing. And the problem with that is it can lead to a lot of three and outs. Let me explain that further with the very second play that I'm going to be showing you. Rondell Moore is in motion. Okay, lines up in the backfield, and then he goes out towards the right. Kyler Murray dumps off to him. This ends up being a four-yard loss. Did we not learn anything from last season where Moore was averaging seven, eight, nine yards of reception? Wasn't really doing anything to contribute to the Arizona Cardinals offense that much. This leads to a four-yard loss, can lead to a lot of three and outs. The next play we want to show you, back shoulder throw outside. Okay, cool. Nothing wrong with that. But again, this is only a three-yard toss. If it were complete, this is again is going to lead to a lot of three and outs, uh, unconverted third downs. Your team goes off on offense and now on defense. And the last play we want to show you is an end around to Rondell Moore. It's creative. I give him props for that. But the problem with this is that the left tackle motions right because everybody's motioning right to try to fake out the defense that Kyler Murray is going to be the one running the ball. First off, the defense did their homework. They know that Murray is only averaging, what, two, three, four carries a game. Not that much. So he's really not going to have a lot of design runs. And then the defensive end is going to say, oh, I am free. I can go on the outside and just try to sack Kyler Murray that way. Oh, no, you hand it off to Rondo Moore. Okay, even better. I can chase him down for a loss. This was also zone coverage. So even if the tackle blocks that defensive end, you still have two defensive backs on the left side of the field that can chase down Rondo Moore and kind of limit him to just a one, two, three-yard gain again. Not a lot of yards you're getting, and it's going to lead a lot of three and outs and a lot of unconverted third downs. That is what's happening with the Arizona Cardinals. They're not taking a lot of shots downfield. And when they are, Kyler Murray, incomplete pass, interception like it was against the Philadelphia Eagles, it's just not working out. By the time they get to the second half, they're like, oh, crap, we're down by 14, down by 20. Let's throw it deep. Let's go incorporate Marquise Brown a little bit more and try to get something out of our quarterback. So... Like, in theory, it's a very good strategy. Like, Tom Brady has made a living just dumping the ball off and letting his receivers do a lot of yards after the catch. But for the Cardinals, it's just not working out. Like, this kind of strategy and this play calling, like, it seems like, okay, they want to dominate the time of possession, keep the opposing offense off the field, but you don't have an established run game to really help with that. For the Cleveland Browns in 2022, like, they are so good and dominating time of possession because they have two established running backs that do a very good job of getting four, five, six yards of carry. 
for the Cardinals, James Conner, it just hasn't been working out this season for them. And then when I talked about Kyler Murray only averaging like two, three, four, five carries a game, like you're not really utilizing him as much as a rusher, which is something that he's done very well in his career. I like to see him get utilized more. And they run option game and uh, design QB runs rather than uh, having to depend on your legs only if the play breaks down, the offensive line breaks down, and you have no other choice. Uh, I do think things are going to get better once DeAndre Hopkins comes back. Then you can transition from those short passes to more intermediate passes, get more chunk yardage and move the chains and be on the field longer. I get it. But right now, until Hopkins comes back, and this will be the last week without Hopkins, until Hopkins comes back, like it, it's going to be it's going to be very tough. And they're always down in these deficits because you get a lot of three and outs, unconverted third downs, and your defense is just not playing well enough to stop the opposing offense. So leave your comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's going on with the Cardinals and uh, what needs to change. But, I mean, that's just my two cents. Like in the first half, you just got to be a little bit more aggressive uh, and not really rely on Rondo Moore getting these end of rounds and only averaging four, five yards of reception. Like that's just not going to cut it. To wrap up this episode, what we do every week is preview the week ahead. So week six of the 2022 season, we just kind of go through each game, just kind of give you our initial thoughts uh, and maybe even teams that could pull off the upset uh, going into week six. So uh, the Thursday night football game, it kicks off in prime video. Bro, it's been brutal with prime video. I mean, like the presentation of Sunday night football top tier presentation with all of these established networks top tier with prime video. It's like, I mean, I, I don't want to vet, kind of like uh, Urban Meyer. I said that. No, he's more of like a college football guy. Like us NFL fans, like we know like it's not going to work out with Urban Meyer. Us NFL fans know it's not going to work out with Kirk Herbstreit. I could have told you that before he even got signed on. I was like, dude, this guy's like, no. Like all the respect in the world to the guy, to the man, like commentator wise, like he has good communication skills. But as far as like covering NFL games. He doesn't like really know a lot of the players' names. So he'll say like number 73, number 57, number 69. Nice. You know, it's just like, oh gosh. Uh, but it's gonna be even more brutal with the Washington Commanders versus Chicago Bears. This could be one of those games where it's like, okay, two bad teams, but it could actually be like pretty decent. I hope. I mean, anything could be better than last week. So uh sorry that we had to kick off the week and it's probably gonna have low viewership this week, but uh, who knows? Maybe it'll be an exciting game. Uh, 49ers-Falcons. You know, if I had to pick an upset, I mean, the fa the Falcons have been in all of the games this year. All of them. Like, they kind of got screwed last week, but I, I could see the Falcons pulling off an upset this week. The defense, like, Falcons offense versus 49ers defense is going to be very, very tough, but I could see it happening. I could, I could see the Atlanta defense stepping up against the 49ers offense. And if that happens, then I, I think the 49ers have a good shot at losing this game. Uh, Browns, Patriots, Ramondre Stevenson is probably going to take over. Damian Harris seems like he's going to be out. I don't know about Mac Jones. He was doubtful going into the last week. Uh, but if he comes back, that's going to be good. Jacoby Myers has really stepped up, man, as a wide receiver one. Uh, but, yeah, Patriots, Browns, both two and three. Got to get their season turned around right here. Jets, Packers. I got a buddy that says he's a Jets fan. He's like, I don't care about the Jets until they are above 500. Well, this is your week to start caring. And then maybe they go back to 500 after the loss against the Green Bay Packers. Maybe they pull off the upset, but um, we did pick the Jets to beat the Dolphins last week, though, so proud of that one. Jaguars-Colts, okay, 24-0 shutout earlier this season. Oof, will it happen again? I doubt it, man. I, I doubt it. I think Jonathan Taylor might be coming back in this game. Uh, I know he was active in week two, but I don't think they get shut out this week. Uh, Vikings, Dolphins, we don't know the status of Tua just yet. I assume he's going to be out. We don't know the status of Teddy Bridgewater. I assume he's probably going to be out unless he like cleared concussion protocol. I don't know. The Vikings, 4-1. Four 4-1, and one. Four and one. my Super Bowl uh, prediction this year, and I, I know I'm probably dumb for thinking this, but uh, I said Chargers, uh, Vikings was my Super Bowl. The Vikings so far are, are proven like, okay, yeah, maybe they could, you know, four and one, maybe they could pull it off. But 
The Chargers, not so much. We'll talk about that when we get to them uh, with the Monday Night Football game. Bengals, uh, Saints, okay, return to LSU, uh, Louisiana, I should say. Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, all those guys. Uh, yeah, something's off with the Bengals. Um, a lot of people are double covering uh, or, or planning for Jamar Chase, and it's just not like really working out for him. T. Higgins is dealing with an ankle issue as well. So the Saints defense, like, don't be surprised if they limit the Bengals' offense to like less than 24 points or anything like that. Uh, Ravens, Giants, Giants four and one. Ravens three and two. Okay, I know what you're thinking. The Giants, like, what the heck? They're four and one. Are they actually legit? There might be. Their defense is really good. And Daniel Jones is just doing enough to where he's not really causing a, a, a problem for the Giants. But I think the Ravens probably have this one. I mean, I, I don't uh, doubt Lamar Jackson. I think after beating the Bengals, the Ravens are the favorites to win the AFC North. And I think they could get pretty far uh, in the playoffs. Could potentially make the Super Bowl. Bucks Steelers. Kenny Pickett didn't look that bad. I mean, he had an interception. I get it. But against the Bills, supposedly pretty decent defense. I mean, he threw for over 300 yards in his NFL debut. So uh, not that bad, but, you know, Tom Brady and the Bucks, that's that's going to be tough to beat. The Panthers and their new regime versus the L.A. Rams, it's not looking good for the Rams. This could be the week that they turn it around, though, hopefully. Like, they could go to 3-3 three and three and then just forget about the pass. Let's look forward. Uh, Panthers firing their defensive coordinator as well. Like, cause the Rams struggle against tough defenses, the Panthers firing their defensive coordinator. This could be, uh, you know, what show for crap show for, uh, the Bengals or the, the Panthers. So Rams could do some damage. Cardinal Seahawks, Gino, man, not writing back, not writing back this season. Cardinals looking, uh, we just talked about them kind of looking questionable. So the Seahawks could pull off the upset, but, uh, eh. I don't know, man. I think I think eventually the magic for Gino has to run out eventually. Uh, maybe I shouldn't write him out. Yeah, I'm not going to write him off because I don't want him to not write back. I want him to write back to me. So, uh, Seahawks, I'll, I'll give him a shot. I'll give him a shot. Gino Smith has been looking very, very good. Uh, Buffalo Bills, Kansas City Chiefs is probably the game of the week. Uh, we saw what happened last year in the playoffs. Uh, Travis Kelsey, seven receptions, 25 yards, man, and four touchdowns. They planned. They, hey, they planned for Travis Kelsey. The Raiders did. Only allowing 25 yards. But in the red zone, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. They didn't plan for it. Uh, Sunday Night Football, Cowboys, Eagles. We don't know the status of Dak Prescott just yet, but I think he's going to be out, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, like, he hasn't been practicing at all so far, and he's always been shut down. So he hasn't even had a limited practice this week or so far since he's been injured, so... I think it's going to be Cooper Rush, and Cooper Rush might lose his first NFL game against an undefeated team. And then Monday Night Football, Broncos versus Chargers. Man, a lot of controversy, dude, with the uh, with the Denver Broncos. As far as Russell Wilson goes and, like, everything going on with his character and everything. I mean, we don't really, on this show, talk about drama or anything like that. But if it involves football, what it means for the football team, then we'll talk about that. Maybe he's losing a hold on the locker room. KJ Hamler... Seemed visibly upset last week. I get it. A lot of former players as well seem visibly upset with what Russell Wilson is doing. I get it, but whatever. Hey, talk about players that are visibly upset at what someone else on their team is doing. How about Keenan Allen being upset with Brandon Staley after that call to go on in on fourth and two against the Cleveland Browns? Instead of just punting it away when the Browns had no timeouts. Yeah, okay, whatever. Like, you decide to, to go for it on 4th and 2. And then uh, Keenan Allen tweeting out, uh, uh, what the F are we doing? I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, I guess Chargers fans are over Brandon Staley at this point. But uh, I'm still going to ride with them. I'm going to say Vikings Chargers, still my Super Bowl pick. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna stick with it. Got to stick with it. Uh, but that brings us to an end to this episode. I appreciate you guys watching. Again, subscribe to this channel if you aren't already subscribed. And uh, give me a follow on Twitter at, as well, at It's the Sun Con. We'll love to chat with you guys throughout the week, throughout the duration of the games. Please keep me awake during this Washington-Chicago game that is going to be happening on Thursday night. With all that said, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Take care.